Hey there, MC Schrafel here, coming to you from the lockdown once again, and today the topic is eat. How do we do that in order to feel great, live well, and long? So the goal here is to give you some heuristics where you can start to empower your choices around food. Uh, this is situating eat within the in five model we've been talking about of move, eat, engage, cogitate, and sleep, the five fundamentals that are wired into us for thriving, and about learning how to tune each of these um, to be at our best as long as we want to be at that best. So if we ask the question, why do we eat? There's a bunch of reasons. There's the usual reason we might talk about where food is necessary both for the energy it gives us, for when we're talking about um, that, when we're talking about breathing, and for also the uh, material it gives us for tissue repair. We're talking about that in terms of metabolic flexibility. Uh, around that uh, for our performance to do any of the other in five of uh, moving, even sleeping. Uh, but there's also these other cool components that uh, come into play with eating that are also really important for us, like social interaction. One of the in five is engaged, so it feeds into that in terms of having our feasts together. The pleasure that we get from the foods that we eat connects with that homeostatic quality that makes us enjoy eating, getting the nutrition that, that we actually need. And there's also the negative sides of uh, using food uh, as a replacement for, you know, if we're a little bored having food to eat for pleasure, for its palatability, um, other components. So there's a lot going on with eating. It's complex. Something that's also complex is what the heck is hunger? And there is that homeostatic side to hunger in terms of making sure that we do get the nutrients that we need to be able to uh, move and continue to engage with each other for, for our health. But there's also um, the habituated part of what feels like a hunger cue. When we learned about ghrelin uh, in the scientific community a little over a decade ago, um, that is the hormone that triggers that sense we need to eat. But the interesting thing about ghrelin is that we adapt to it. So if we're used to eating at three specific times every day, that ghrelin trigger is going to go off. But if we start to shift when we eat or we eat less frequently, that ghrelin is going to go down. In fact, people that have been on longer fasts, or I guess they'd still call them short fasts, three to ten days, um, their, their hunger cues actually go down. So there's this dual aspect to getting cued to have hunger, real hunger that very few of us have actually gone through um, versus this hedonic cue or habit to eat. So related to hunger and uh, when we, why we eat is what to eat. And many of us have as our guideposts or have experience with everything from calorie counting to nutrition labels and trying to factor these things out to say, okay, how do, how do I figure out if I'm eating too much, uh, not enough, am I eating the right stuff, not enough. Um, these approaches, uh, while they can be functional, are putting us in a position where we're at a remove from the food, where you're kind of relying on, on these weird measures of things that we can't see or touch to tell us is it okay to eat it? And these labels came up really as a way to deal with stuff in boxes, not whole foods that is uh, kind of impervious to looking at it. You can't look at a cake mix and really say, oh, I know what's in that. So here's a, here's a suggestion is move back to what you can see. And when we can rely on our senses, uh, being able to see something, touch something, smell something, uh, then we can use that to make an assessment about whether or not this is a good thing to eat. So that's why we've been talking about before, you know, more whole foods because we can see what it is. And how do you interpret what you're seeing? Well, here's the heuristic is start with the green. Um, if you start with green, you can have as much of it as you want without paying any penalty at your waistline. Uh, it's also got the awesome nutrients that we need to thrive. It's got not bad energy depending on how much you might be working out, and we'll get into that. So if you start with greens and then you stay in the dark color areas, you're going to be doing great for most of all the nutritional needs that you have. And the cool thing about these things, well, we'll get to that, is, is how quickly and easily they can be prepared. Now the other side of this, what folks usually talk about in terms of protein or meat, is that 
Uh, we need certain other nutrients for foods that come from on the um, meat-eating side. Meat will do it for you. Anything that had eyes in it is going to take care of that because it's already ingested everything it needs to create those what are called essential amino acids that we actually need to get from food that our bodies that are amazing at synthesizing stuff just can't synthesize. But there are also non-meat options like uh, lentils, nuts, so on, is what I'm calling the hard stuff here. And also fungus, or fungi, I guess for the plural here, is that you can combine all sorts of plant-based sources to get those essential amino acids. So you've got a lot of choices, but they are all really easy to identify by being able to use your eyes to know what something is, um, and your uh, sense of touch to check out, you know, is this, is this vegetable past its uh, sell-by date or is this fruit really uh, ripe yet? All those kinds of things uh, are not requiring you to look at labels at all. And so that's, that's a great place to be with, with food. Uh, in more detail, there are these kinds of charts that are available, and I'll, I'll provide a link uh, for you, around how to assess what kinds of, of colored foods, if you're, if you're not satisfied with those simple heuristics about eat green first and then dark colors and then look at what you need on the eye side um, or the hard stuff or the fungi, you can get into looking at, well, different types of uh, the veggies that you might want or how they're prepared or to understand, is it okay to have, you know, what if I want ice cream? Uh, how to fit that in there. One other thing to take a look at within that space are what I'm going to talk about is these plant food type ratios. Like I said, you can eat as much on the green stuff as you want. In fact, another way of thinking about this, if you have a little knowledge about uh, how these plants are actually produced, is that the stuff that grows above ground is cool because for the most part you can eat that either raw or cooked. So you've got lots of options there and that affects their, their nutrient profile actually, the different way that you prepare stuff. Or um, you can have stuff that is underground, and most of the underground stuff is usually more nutritionally available when it's cooked. A carrot is a really cool example of something that you pull up from the ground, um, and you can eat it either raw or cooked, but you can have more nutrients available to you when that one's cooked, actually. Um, that's kind of cool. So uh, it's also a way you can think about this if you're, if you're wanting to use these... Um, food strategically, these plants strategically, is that again, any time at all, you can have the greens as much as you want. If, say you're trying to get a little bit leaner uh, and you're not moving too much on a particular day, it's, it's a more work-oriented day or whatever, you're just going for a walk that day, you can focus on having the above ground uh, plants as much of them as you want, lots of nutritional density there. On those days when you might be working harder, doing your more intense workouts, is you've kind of earned, as John Berardi likes to say, those more energy-dense plus nutrient-dense um, plants like uh, squashes or, um, what are we seeing here, sweet potatoes. And celeriac is kind of one exception. A lot of people use the celeriac for a replacement for a potato because it's really nutritious, but it's also extremely energy-light. Uh, relative to the other underground veggies. Um, of course, a related question to this is, well, okay, I've got the what's to eat figured out, but how much do I actually eat? Well, a good baseline, again, that uh, uh, Berardi's group at Precision Nutrition, I'll put you a, a link down for that too, came up with is, again, how do you use what you can see as opposed to using calories to figure out how much of what to eat. And over on the protein side, you can see that they're suggesting a palm's worth of protein, and the palm is relative to your own body size. Fists for the starchier um, or underground plants, if you will, and a cupped hand for the veggies that are above ground, and then the thumb for any additional uh, nuts, uh, fats, these kinds of things. It's really focusing on the fats. Uh, so these are ways that you can think about what to put on your plate for women or for men. And the thing to be aware of in that space, though, is thinking about um, you can tune this depending on your uh, 
load? What are you what are you using up of the nutrients that you put into your body that need to be replaced? Again, if you're not doing a lot of heavy work, the baseline of uh, the hand for figuring out uh, how much to have on your plate is a really great starting place. That's assuming kind of a three meal a day thing. But if you find that you are losing weight or losing energy, you might want to start to play around and tune those things. So we've covered the kind of um, what to eat, how much to eat, how to figure out what things to get onto your plate, uh, using the things that you have in front of you, by to look at something, touch it, feel it, smell it. Uh, something else that you can think of to mix into these whole foods is taking it uh, to a next processing level, which is fermentation. And this is the prebiotic, probiotic thing. The prebiotic you can look at is all of those great whole foods plants that you're putting into your gut are like the soil that good things need to thrive in. But bacteria is a huge part of how we process food in our guts. And it's part of what's known as the gut-brain axis. And it's been shown that by having these things that we know about as probiotics uh, in our food source that is bringing healthy good bacteria into our gut to work with those prebiotic or whole fibery foods that we have in our digestion, then the brain is a happy place. And we've talked a little bit about this before in terms of looking at especially that big cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve that connects the brain, uh, brainstem in particular, to the rest of our uh, central inner organs, if you will, of which the gut is a huge part, and that we know that the health of the gut is connected to the state of the brain. So in other words, depression has been strongly connected to the state of this pathway, and one way to help that pathway uh, be effective is, it seems, the quality of the bacteria in the gut. And so by throwing in some fermented foods, um, whether it's kimchi, sauerkraut is the one that I was showing before. I've got a video on how to make sauerkraut at home. All these are really cheap. You also see here some kombuku. You can make that. You don't even need to buy a starter from that. They're, you, it's so cheap to do this. There's water kefir. There's, there's oats uh, that have been fermenting by, by adding water and letting them sit out on the counter. Uh, there's red wine vinegar. So there's all sorts of very unesoteric types of ways to get some fermented foods into the gut um, as a supplement to those whole foods that we're talking about that will not only help um, the material of our bodies, but especially our cognitive performance and, and our emotional well-being too. So food's connected. But while I'm talking about emotional well-being, let me just say right now, there is no bad food. I hate it when people start talking. I'm kind of sorry, I'm letting some personality out here. As I'm, but I do get a little disturbed when people talk about bad food or uh, what's unhealthy food. It all depends on the context. If, if you've just gone for a huge run or you've run a race and you want to celebrate you know, you grab the Danish if you feel so inclined and, and, and do that happy dance with that. Uh, you, you've earned it, your body's going to burn it up, and it's not a chronic uh, thing. It's an acute burst of uh, highly processed carbohydrates. Why not? Um, but that's the thing. It's understanding when is a particular thing okay. The dose is in, the poison's in the dose, as Mithridates said. So with that context then you can start to balance things. Now, another thing that I get asked about is what the heck is, is going on when I'm feeling hangry? If you haven't heard this word before, hangry has become so common that people are given it a word where you, apparently you, you're just you're feeling hungry and mean at the same time. And I, and I saw this definition of it as a state of anger caused by lack of food Hunger causing a negative change in emotional state. Well, as we've talked about, very few of us get the chance to be really hungry. And this actually happens um, not because we're hungry, per se, that is, that we're, we're low on particular kinds of nutrients, but something that's going on in the bloodstream. So that definition is actually technically wrong. It is what is happening when particular uh, hormones, here in this case epinephrine and cortisol, get triggered in a state of lacking of uh, blood glucose. So the blood glucose drops. These hormones are in our lives to fire up to get more blood glucose back into the bloodstream. Why? 
because if we're going to be in a threat response and this is what we've had, oh my god, the blood glucose level has dropped and I might have to run away from the tiger so I need to get this going, these hormones actually have a kind of an aggressive edge to them. They're the same ones that fire up when you're uh, in a workout. Um, and if you've ever noticed that, if you do an intense workout and somebody tries to interrupt you, you might go grr at them. Uh, this is why. These are the hormones that are up trying to make sure that you have uh, fast energy sources in your bloodstream. But this is habituated. And by better eating practices, and usually the hangry stuff can be associated with folks who are used to eating uh, more highly processed foods than whole foods uh, and having frequent access to them. So that means to reduce hanger, the fastest way to healthily reduce hanger is to change some eating habits, to up those uh, greens, those whole foods, those dark colors in the diet and slowly get used to spacing out um, the periods between the eating. And that is a toughie, that's an adaptation that we're asking our bodies to go through. And while adaptation can be crucial, it is also uncomfortable. It's essential. Anytime we ask the body to take on something that is new to it and might be a change, there is discomfort. So what we can do to be gentle with ourselves is to appreciate that that is a a threat response. We are actually threatening ourselves if we are changing what we are habituated to. So we need to do that um, with gentleness and compassion to ourselves, um, but it will happen and help ourselves prepare for that. So if you decide all of a sudden, well, I'm not going to have that extra snack at work, um, you might want to think about instead of just getting rid of it entirely, replacing it with, say, uh, if it's like, let's use a gross example of, uh, by gross I just mean a large, easy to visualize example of having a Danish uh, 1030 coffee slot. And if you take that away, your body is probably going to react in a nasty way, um, especially if you're not totally occupied by something else. And a way to address that might be, as you can probably think of, well, how would, how would you swap out? What would you swap in for that? Maybe some blueberries, maybe some strawberries, some dark fruits. Um, we'll still have a sugar kick into them, uh, but will be less. So the transition to getting to a point where you don't need anything at all uh, is, is more gentle for your body and can adapt uh, gracefully and gradually to that. So the point is, you will, you will get to that place, but create a pathway. Be gentle with yourself in making that transition. Um, so again, just the uh, unhungry adaptation is to realize that your body is doing something. It's not just an emotional thing that you're having, we, and that emotional stuff is connected to physiological responses, that this can be adapted first by improving um, the foods that you are eating when you're not having that mid-morning or mid-afternoon snack, if you do that, that also will create a slower trickle into the bloodstream, but a more constant trickle into the bloodstream of the sugar that it needs so you don't have those spikes and crashes. And then after you've gotten used to that over time, you can start to look at, well, what if I reduce the amount of food, even the quality stuff that I'm having till I find out what point it is where I am uh, sufficient, I'm healthy and full of energy, um, and that's all great. And then we can start to explore this next question as we wrap up around um, when should we be eating? So what, why eat, what to eat, uh, how to think about it in terms of what choices we're making, uh, the effects of that, but also then this question, when, when do we eat or when do we not eat might be a way of framing the question. And what current research seems to be suggesting is probably what uh, humans pre-modern um, civilization or even medieval civilization or well just civilization period, I blame farming, um, is, is it related to light. So when we should be eating is when we are most active. For many of us that's the earlier part of the day than the later part of the day and that we should uh, start to taper off as the light goes down. And why is that? Well it seems that every cell in our body is connected to some kind of clock uh, that synchronizes with the light of day. And what happens at different parts of the cycle, it's not like something turns off, 
but it switches. There are different things that our body does at different times of the day, and those switches are signaled by the light, and that our body is supposed to sync with that light. And when we do things that take our body out of synchrony, for instance, it gets dark and we are still eating and we're not really active, that doesn't let the body switch into a particular state for rebuilding tissue, for repair, for clearing the crud out of our brains, literally. Um, and that all takes a certain amount of time. So the heuristic is to be sure to have a sufficient length of pause from eating at an appropriate time so that our bodies can go through the repair cycle. And one of the things that folks have been talking about and that the research seems to suggest is a kind of good minimum is to give ourselves at least 13 hours without ingesting any food. So figure that out. What is that going to work at for when you need to stop eating at night? Um, and here's, here's the next part of it, if you really want to get intrigued about this, is that it seems, now this is really early uh, literature, but it seems that trying to end eating as early in our active part of our day as possible, and I'm talking like two in the afternoon, uh, seems to be having huge beneficial effects, and I'm going to caveat that by saying for people who do not have a regular good intense movement practice. So... Um, exercise seems to mitigate some of these factors, but for the most part, um, it's being able to give ourselves that break from eating for our bodies to do something else and to optimize that break by syncing it up with overnight repair cycles. And uh, this is something that you can test uh, yourself, and this is not necessarily focusing on any kind of fat burning for weight loss or anything, though that though there's a lot connecting the two, it's just for that um, total body repair, well-being, uh, sustenance. What you might find is if you try to give yourself 13 hours fast overnight, uh, look at how frequently you get a cold or don't, or um, how much more work you get done, or any of these other kinds of measures besides just body-based measures to see how something as simple as that can be effective. Now, there's other folks who will talk about um, extending the fast, 16-8, uh, these kind of ratios are things that are being discussed. They're starting to be uh, looked at in the literature. Um, but just, again, starting with, for sure, this 13-hour overnight fast, letting the body connect with its natural rhythms, uh, for repair seems to have uh, fantastic support behind it. So that's something to think about in terms of when to eat. Eat during the day, eat, do most of your big eating when you're most active, and, and be ready to stop. And again, be gentle with yourself in doing this because that's a huge uh, hedonic adaptation to get that ghrelin to shift to work with you. Um, some of the things you can do in terms of food craving practices, again, that uh, cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, is involved with this. Sometimes we have cravings, as I said, for not for hunger, but for emotional uh, needs. And we we are looking at the uh, interoceptive responses of the body. So some things you can do if you're having a food craving is, believe it or not, rubbing your left ear can stimulate uh, the vagus nerve and help potentially calm that down. Uh, Rubbing your gut area can also stimulate other senses that might help offset what we translate as hunger or cravings by satisfying another sense. Chewing gum, not just because of the chewing motion, but also sometimes that minty hit will mitigate the desire for palatable food, warm water. Um, these are things you can explore. Just putting it out there to let you know there are options of dealing with these cravings that you might not have considered before. And one of the last things to touch on here is that we are really uh, looking at food in a larger context. Uh, as we saw that, that we can use food to connect us to the microbiome, to the bacteria around us. We've looked at how we breathe affects how we oxidize uh, food and energy. And that light and dark are also intimately connected with our body clocks to help us be as healthy as possible. So... These are some things that we can think about as we, the goal here again has been to explore and tune in 
how to use uh, the quality of the food strategically so that we can look at less quantity uh, because it seems that, that uh, our efficiency in terms of health is running um, these lean, mean machines that are slightly hungry uh, some of the time but are extremely resistant. So if we just take a look at this, um, what we've been talking about here is that food is more than just the energy or the nutrients that you put on the plate. Mm, depends on context of eating, so there's really no bad foods. Um, and that we convert all this food into these wonderful uh, things for our bodies, but that it also connects us to the environment, that, that boundary between what I've called the embodied and the circumbodied, the, the body that's around us is mediated in some respects by food, and that food cravings themselves, why we want to eat, might actually be turning to something else like uh, the vagus nerve, interoceptive connections that we can start to um, connect with. And that a way to get away from calorie counting or nutrition labels is can we see the food? And if we can see what we're about to eat, those whole foods, plants, the uh, meats, etc., then we can make assessments about how much of them do we want? Uh, what's what are the qualities that we're looking for? Um, and so that's that's kind of the main overview of this section. And just a couple of notes to consider is again that I've talked about these things are complex. <laughs> and again, we've gone through the how, what, why, and when of food. And and it's completely reasonable at this point to outsource this. And that's why I've set up this uh, connection with the folks at Cali Move because they get you moving, but they've also got these components, especially in their home workout, around eating sensibly and how to explore that. So that's one thing. And then another is um, everybody needs a coach every once in a while for anything where we're trying to build a practice. And so you can have a program like the one that I've suggested with a coupon on it um, till June 13th. Um, you can still use the link after that, but the coupon's good till the 13th. Uh, also, you can look for somebody that you can trust um, to talk to once in a while to help you tune your practice, especially if something seems like it's not working the way it should. Uh, that has value. You can do that and save a lot of time and hassle and frustration. So I would encourage you to explore that as, as an option. And so with all that said, um, there are lots of topics uh, within this space. We've tried to touch on a, on a few of them. I hope these heuristics are helpful for you to start thinking about the what, why, when, uh, and how. Of, of your eating practice and uh, leave a note. Let me know how it goes because the big question here that you want to check in with yourself about is simply how do you feel and use these heuristics to tune in feeling as fantastic as you possibly can. All right, I'll look forward to talking with you again real soon. Bye now.